question of where COVID-19 came from, whether it came naturally from the wild or from a laboratory in Wuhan, has become one of the most intense and polarizing questions. This is a dialogue between Yuri Dagan of the Drastic Collective that uncovered much of the evidence implicating the lab, and Stuart Neal, a virology professor from King's College, who leans more towards the idea that it came from the wild, or zoonosis. So this conversation was recorded a couple of weeks ago, and it gets pretty into the weeds at times. I've decided to put it out unedited, but it is pretty heavy going in places unless you've been following the technical details about furing cleavage sites and stuff like that. And so to help the casual viewer, I've added the time codes below in the show notes that will take you to some of the more accessible pieces. So Yuri and Stuart have offered to come back for a follow-up. So let us know in the comments what you made of it, any unanswered questions, and how we might do this better in the future. So this is a dialogue about the lab leak hypothesis between Yuri Dagan of the Drastic Collective that uncovered a lot of evidence that points to the possibility that it could come from a lab, and Stuart Neal, who is a virology professor from King's College in London. Welcome to both. Hello. Yep. So I'm just going to frame the, the conversation that we're going to have. The intention is to have the conversation about the evidence base for and against the lab leak, whether the virus came from a lab or came from the wild zoonosis. Um, this topic has become incredibly polarizing. There's a lot of heat around it and not a lot of light. So the intention with this conversation is to have a lot more light than heat. Um, this isn't going to be scoring points off each other, but between two people who I believe are genuinely interested in truth and interested in dialogue with dialoguing with each other. Um, I personally, uh, we featured films on this. I was personally persuaded by the case for lab leak or that it was a, a valid hypothesis very early in the pandemic. But then I realized that I had, I was, having a lot more certainty than like I, I didn't actually know like it wasn't for sure one way or another so I started kind of interrogating my own thought process and thought well why am I so sure about this and then I started thinking okay this would be a really good thing to hold a dialogue on because I feel like the level of certainty out there one side or the other seems excessive and people sort of going to war over their particular narratives um, and so I've wanted to host a conversation like this for quite a while. And I've, I've struggled, to be honest, because I think, I think because it's become so polarizing, because it's become so heated, people have been unwilling to, to kind of go into this. Um, so the format of this conversation, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves uh, briefly and summarize what you'd like to get out of the conversation, what you feel about this conversation. Like, are there any, was there any resistance? Is there any concerns? Um, and then we'll go into you each outlining your main points. You've got some sort of bullet points of what you think are the key points at issue. And then after that, we'll go into more of a dialogue uh, back and forth between you. Um, but maybe maybe start with, with you, Stuart. What do you hope to get out of this conversation? And do you have any concerns about the way that this debate has been has gone in the past? I mean... I haven't really got very much more to add about the quality of this debate as it's played out on Twitter than you've already uh, kind of um, kind of articulated. I mean, it has got very polarised. It has got very heated. There are plenty of things we can agree on reasonably <laughs> about what questions there need to be answered. I think there's a lot of a lot of evidence out there that's open to interpretation. And I think it's probably wise to have a more calm and cool discussion about it and what we understand and what we don't understand. I, th I think there's a lot of, lot of nuance and technical um, understanding about the, about the nature of the evidence for a zoonotic spillover that sometimes doesn't play out very well in 250 characters. And Yuri? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll actually start. Yuri, we've had you on before talking about this, and I think you've said that you thought the lab leak was at about 95% chance. Right. You still, what, what do you think now? What are you hoping to get from this conversation? Right, well, what I think now, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm still up in the high 90s. At some point, I thought it's closer to 99 when I heard the intel from uh, 
uh, Josh Rogan, I think, that the three uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology staffers who were sick in November 2019 actually had COVID-like symptoms, most important of which was anosmia, loss of smell, because for me, that's a kind of differentiating diagnosis, COVID versus the flu, for example. But kind of this has been announced in August, and since then it's been kind of quiet. So I think that kind of piece of intel is a little bit suspect. So that kind of moving the needle needle for me, like between 99, 95, I don't know. But I mean, it, it's, yeah, in the, in the high 90s at this point. Uh, um, what do I hope to get out of this conversation? I guess just maybe to show like the normal people <laughs> that there's a lot closer positions between reasonable people in the lab league camp and reasonable people in the virology camp than heated Twitter conversations or exchanges might kind of lead people to believe that that's hugely polarized and like the lab leak, all of the lab leak are like crazies who would come up with any contorted scenarios to explain their narrative rather than actually be willing to dig for the truth. I mean, personally, to be honest, I probably would really actually like it to be a zoonotic spillover and not a lab leak, just, you know, for the sake of scientific community and the sake of the world, it's much better to have like a natural freak accident and a huge coincidence than actually have people like sloppy scientists who might have let this one get away and then cover it up and like huge conspiracy to cover up between the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese scientists and American scientists and who might have funded it. Like the second scenario is, is much less kind of preferable for me because just of the general faith in humanity. But, you know, um, so I, I keep an open mind and I just, you know, I want to have a reasonable dialogue with someone who I think is also a very reasonable person, but just kind of thinks of the, or interprets the available evidence differently. And maybe in conversation with, Stuart, I might, you know, change some of my own understanding, or maybe he'll change some of his understanding. Maybe there's just something that we're misunderstanding about the available data that hopefully without all of the kind of emotional, uh, like team lab leak or, you know, team zoonosis, we can just be, you know, very open-minded and yeah, like a very friendly Discussion, non-debate, right? Not a debate, not a debate. It's a discussion. So dialectic, to quote your favorite podcaster, Stuart. And, uh, you know, and yours. <laughs> and only one I've ever been on. Uh, well, <laughs> and, and, and Stuart, so so Yuri was at 95% thinking that it was probably a lab leak. Um, and also Yuri mentioned that the kind of, on one side, it's like the people who think it was a lab leak have been sort of painted as just conspiracy theorists. On the other side, people who believe that it was zoonosis have been painted as kind of mainstream shills or in some ways kind of paid off by the establishment. Mm. Um, what, firstly, what do you make of that? And what's your percentage of, of where you think, whether oh. you think it was uh, zoonosis? I mean, well, I mean, let's, 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 let's start that with a definition. I mean, a zoonosis is a, is a skipping of one pathogen into another species. Um, you know, this whatever debate we have, I mean, no one's going to disagree that this virus was originally a bat virus. So, you know, by definition, it is a zoonosis. The question is where that zoonosis actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can we can agree on that. So, um, so I think the major thing to try and, uh, I mean, in terms of the. In terms of whether it's a, um, a natural zoonosis or a an artificial zoonosis, if you like, then I think in terms of the virus, I think there's nothing to my mind in the virus that is inconsistent with it being a natural virus that exists out there somewhere. And whether... Yeah, so in that respect, I am fairly confident obviously it's a natural virus in terms of how it got in via a, whether it got in via a, a zoonosis outside a lab or inside a lab i think i'm 
fairly still in the camp of being 90% towards the um, natural environment and then 10% because there are stuff that we can't rule out. So there we right. go. So 90%, 95% and 90%. We'll see if there's any shift in that at the end of the conversation. <laughs> um, so, Opposites, so I guess. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you completely flip. That would be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if I, if Both I, of us. <laughs> we can so, turn Gary into a Zunati, then we'll be sorted. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's begin. I'm going to ask Yuri if you could outline... So you've both put together a sort of bullet points of what you think are the key points at issue, key questions. And I'm going to ask you if you could outline your case first, and I'll ask you, Stuart, to, to outline your case. Then I'll see whether we can agree on what the key questions are. Like, what are the key pieces of evidence that might shift it one way or the other? What are the, the issues that need to be resolved to, to, to resolve the question? And see if maybe we could agree on that, and then we'll go into kind of responding to each each other's points uh, towards the end of the conversation. Um, but Yuri, would you like to outline your? Sure. I mean, yeah, the bullet points I guess I outlined were just the things I wanted to discuss. They're not necessarily like in any kind of order of uh, the certainty of evidence. But yeah, basically, there's a bunch of circumstantial evidence that, to my mind, is better explained by a lab -like hypothesis than by just a freak accident of nature of a totally zoonotic virus, totally naturally ending up in Wuhan. So like the biggest question mark is the location of the outbreak. Like what are the chances of a complete freak accident of this virus that is not normally found in this geography to pop up next door to a lab that's been collecting and modifying these viruses for years. So like to me, that alone greatly kind of increases the chances that this is a lab leak than uh, you know, completely natural spillover. Like, I guess we can differentiate to go away from zoonosis versus non-zoonosis, like completely uh, natural or some sort of lab related. Like it could be completely natural virus collected by a lab and they didn't even know, maybe they, they got infected during a field field work and they didn't even know it, but still it's, it's a lab leak because it, it you know kind of gotten back to Wuhan because of lab activity. So, and you know, the, the, the locations being kind of the primary huge piece of circumstantial evidence to for me to weigh kind of the tip the scales towards lab leak scenario. And then there's a bunch of other, uh, well, I, Kind of leaving alone maybe the genetic uh, engineering or not genetic like genetic evidence or genetic makeup of the virus, which absolutely is consistent with both zoonotic spillover or some sort of lab, even genetic engineering. Like you couldn't tell apart whether the virus was genetically engineered or you know if it happened in nature. Both things can arise. I mean, both things can happen, and the virus will look exactly the same. And just by looking at it, you couldn't tell which one it is. It's consistent with both. Um, and so the other pieces of evidence is the kind of the behavior of the Chinese scientists, the Chinese Communist Party, co completely obfuscating behavior and uh, very, the scientists themselves are, have been releasing information in very little snippets as if they're trying, if they have, if they have, as if they have something to hide. Starting with this RATG13 uh, virus that you know is a close relative uh, to SARS-CoV-2, which they, they didn't tell us from the beginning where they got it from. Uh, they kind of miss well hinted that they maybe sequenced it only after the outbreak, but then we found out that they sequenced it much earlier, and that it actually came from this cave where six people have gotten sick. These miners in Mojiang. This also was never told, so they're very non-forthcoming, and so. This forms a kind of second tier of uh, behavioral circumstantial evidence that is consistent, or in my mind, it's not consistent, is more in line with the lab leak scenario than with someone who is actually trying to establish the truth in the completely zoonotic scenario. Like if these scientists believed that it was a totally zoonotic virus and they were trying to go get to the bottom of how it ended up in Wuhan, I would expect them to behave in a very different manner than the way we're seeing them behave. And then, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. 
one of the recent kind of pieces of evidence that emerged is this EcoHealth DARPA proposal where they were proposing very reckless gain of function stuff, including inserting you know novel cleavage sites similar to the furin cleavage site that we see in SARS-CoV-2, which is completely uncharacteristic for these sorts of viruses. Like in bats, furin cleavage sites for these viruses are just not observed. And we've seen hundreds of these SARS Sarbico viruses, bat, bat viruses of this family, and none of them have a furin cleavage site. And for them to actually evolutionarily develop a furin cleavage site is, is very easy. Like it's one or two nucleotide mutations and it, it would arise. But obviously there's sort of some sort of selective pressure against that. And that's why we don't see it in nature. So either this could have happened in the lab through genetic engineering, or maybe some, you know, intermediate host that doesn't have that selective pressure against the furin cleavage site in, you know, one of the billion sort of recombination attempts, the furin cleavage site arose, and then it had positive selective advantage in that host and then eventually jumped into humans, or maybe it happened in the human. I mean, the, those are all possible scenarios, but to me, kind of the likeliest scenarios involve, again, like some sort of a lab, lab leak, either genetic manipulation or some sort of, uh, Passaging experiments, maybe in lab cultures or live animals in the lab. We know that you know Wuhan Institute of Virology has done uh, a lot of experiments, both in live animals and in lab cultures. And I mean, so yeah, I got a whole kind of bunch of bullet points that I wanted to to go over from that kind of bucket of of evidence and some things about like why would they delete a, the database, the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Why would they delete the database with a very silly explanation that it was against hacker attacks, whereas they probably like, if they deleted it, it in, or took it offline in September 2019, the world didn't even know about it. So why would any hackers attack it? And if it's even if it's a if it's a public database, why would you even care about hacker attacks? I mean, what's what's there to hide? If it's a public database? Um, also, uh, I mean, the pangolin connection is it's very, very odd because we know that early in 2019, there were these pangolins that have been infected by a very odd virus that does have the same receptor binding domain as SARS-CoV-2. And uh, I mean, this was in Guangdong and uh, it's, it's entirely possible that uh, the same pangolin samples also were sent to Wuhan Institute of Virology being kind of the premier coronavirus study center. So uh, it's, it, I mean, now we see the same receptor binding domain show up in, in uh, Laos samples uh, being sampled by, you know, Pasteur Institute uh, in, in Laos. And it's also, well, it's possible that maybe the ones in virology had already some sort of sim similar viruses with the same RBM that uh, maybe they experimented with. Um, and of course, uh, the lab leaks, prior lab leaks, we know they happen and they, uh, I mean, we know at least, you know, one pandemic that did arise through a lab leak, the 1977 flu pandemic. We know there was an outbreak in 79 in Sridlovsk in, in the former USSR that was also initially kind of denied and everybody, uh, scientific community seemed to initially at least kind of buy the uh, explanation of the of other scientists and then it completely turned out to be false. So basically, these sorts of things that I hope to have more of a dialogue because I, I kind of realize I'm, I'm, I'm talking for a long time now. Uh, that's cool. I think if you just lay out your your case, I mean, the one thing that I would say, Yuri, have, has there because the the furin cleavage site has always been sort of held up as the kind of smoking gun by a lot of people on the lab leak side. Well, no, no or, not you're by... no longer seeing it quite so quite so kind of convincing. No, I mean, I never said it's a, like smoking gun implies it's sort of, some sort of conclusive. I, I think the only person who said it's a smoking gun is David Baltimore, and he kind of walked backwards from, from that characterization. It's definitely very suspicious, but it's still possible it arose in nature. But the odds are like, I think much higher odds that it was genetically engineered than happened in nature. But of course, even... It, natural occurrence of this furin cleavage that could have happened in a lab through, as I mentioned, you know, animal passaging experiments or cell culture passaging experiments. Um, and yeah, like the human optimized codons, again, it's, it's very suspicious, but of course it can happen in nature. 
And like one of the things that recently at least popped on my radar is that like this particular fragment is found in, well, I mean, it, it, it's found in several mammalian species, but it, it's, it was found in uh, pangolin mRNAs. And uh, like up until now, nobody even like virology community hasn't even considered that it could have been a recombination of coronavirus, not with some other coronavirus, which was like proposed by Gallagher or, or Spiris with very weird scenarios, but they haven't proposed like host mRNA recombination. And uh, so to me, if there is a possibility that it's not genetically engineered, but occurred naturally, the more likely explanation that it could have occurred naturally through combination with host mRNA and pangolin data set that like the, the one that I mentioned from Guangdong, which contained this coronavirus with the same receptor binding domain, when I was kind of searching for the furin cleavage site in the database, data set, just, you know, just, you know, trying to see if it might be, maybe there's a SARS-CoV-2 progenitor there. I didn't find a SARS-CoV-2 progenitor, but I did find this fragment, the same fragment as the furin cleavage site insertion in host mRNAs, in pangolin mRNAs. So it could still be that, you know, it, it happened, it arose through natural means in a pangolin or maybe in a human. I mean, it could, it's possible human mRNA have also similar fragments, but it also could have, that doesn't rule out that it happened in a lab. It, it, like the natural recombination could have happened in an animal being held in, in a lab facility or, you know, experiments in animal cell cultures. So. Can I, can I just sort of jump in on this FCS discussion? Because I think, you know, we're, in danger of probably losing the audience a little bit as well in terms of what what this site is so just to, for for everybody listening in trying to get a handle on this who who aren't so well versed in it as Yuri or I we've got a we've got a viral protein called the spike which is on the surface of the virus that gets the virus into the cell now that spike protein during its entry process into the cell requires a cleavage of that protein in half and for for the most bat or in fact probably all the bats of ecoviruses and quite a lot of coronaviruses in general that cleavage event happens on the way into the target cell right um, what a furin cleavage site does is allows that to be processed on the way out of the cell the virus is already infected. So effectively what you've got is a virus that's coming out already pre-primed to get in. And you find these furin cleavage sites in many, many different types of viruses. Um, and for respiratory viruses, they're often associated with much better spread through the respiratory route. Um, in terms of coronaviruses, while the furin cleavage sites have never been observed thus far, other than SARS-CoV-2 in the in the family, the um, there are plenty of examples of furin cleavage sites in other um, in other coronaviruses, uh, including MERS, so in other respiratory um, spread coronaviruses, and and also including seasonal ones. So they're not unheard of. Now, the thing about this furin cleavage site in SARS-CoV-2 is that it's not the most uh, obvious furin cleavage site that you would see. It's not one that would score brilliantly on a, on a prediction program. Um, it's slightly off kilter with what you'd expect for a, for a very high efficiency furin cleavage site. And in fact, a cleavage sites that look like that in some other very distantly related coronaviruses don't work very well. Um, so the point of the, I, th I think that the people have got to get a, is in terms of SARS-CoV-2, this fear and cleavage site we know now is, is very important for respiratory spread in, in, in animal models. It's essential for spread between individuals. It doesn't necessarily stop the, person, the, the animal or the person who gets a big bolus of that virus, but it does stop them spreading it very, uh, very efficiently. Um, in terms of where it could come from, I think the thing about, and what, Yuri's alluded to it 
almost is that it, it, it's become fairly obvious that this part of the coronavirus spike protein is quite tolerant to insertions and deletions. And um, we've now got some very, very recent evidence from all the sequencing of the virus that's gone around, uh, gone on around the world over the pandemic, that there's very clear evidence of bits of potentially host mRNAs being spliced into this part of the protein um, at low frequency, I should imagine, but uh, it's being picked up. Um, very much abutting to a, a recombination site, which has been supposed to be maybe the reason why this sequence got pasted in in the first place. And you may think that that is a rare event, and it probably is a rare event on a single virus replication scale. But when you add a selective pressure on top of that, then if it has a growth advantage, it will grow out. And I think both Yuri and I agree that, that I mean, I, well, that's put words in his mouth, but um, in terms of my opinion, because we don't see these sites in the bat viruses themselves in the samples from the bat, um, that does tend to suggest to me that this has evolved once that virus is skipped out of the bat into another species because it, 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 it confers a level of respiratory spread that we don't think is the way that the virus is spread between bats. Yeah. So that's yeah, thank cool. you. So thank you for the interjection. I hope people are still with us. We'll find, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stuart, would you like to just outline what you think the key points at issue are, and then we'll go more into a dialogue? Well, I, I guess the, there's the... The contentious points about the features of this virus that are often held up as being unnatural or potentially evidence of laboratory um, laboratory intervention, and and this harks back to earlier early, earlier discussions where the furin cleavage site or the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 were thought to be very very important for human tropism. And the receptor binding domain part, which is the bit that interacts with the human ACE2 protein, actually interacts with the human ACE2 protein probably the best or one of the best interactions of all mammalian ACE2 proteins that there is. Okay. And, and that was always taken as, or has been hitherto taken as evidence by some that, well, that couldn't have happened naturally. That's not a, uh, that's, that, that must be a product of laboratory intervention to select for high efficiency uses of human ACE2 in an artificial system. Um, we now have two examples of receptor binding domains that are almost as good and in the second case better than um, the extant SARS-CoV-2 RBD on human ACE2. One of those being the pangolin viruses that uh, Urias um, alluded to. They are not without their contentious aspects, let's say. <laughs> And now we have these viruses that were discovered on the Laos, Laos um, Chinese border um, and appeared in a preprint some three or four weeks ago now, which have a receptor binding site, which is near as damn it what SARS-CoV-2 has, and in fact probably has even a higher affinity for human ACE2. And these are, these are viruses that are found in bat samples in the wild. So there's no a priori requirement for a RBD of that affinity for human ACE2 to be a product of laboratory manipulation. They, I think I might, I they, might step in here and just, because the, there's a lot of three-letter acronyms being thrown around. So effectively what you're saying is the argument was always this particular part of the virus binds better to humans than any other mammal. And people have taken that to, to argue that that means it must have been optimized for human transmission somehow. And you're saying, no, we're now finding natural samples that are binding better to humans than other. So, so it, it disproves the idea that it must have been engineered. Um, it, 
it doesn't disprove that it must have been engineered strictly. What it disproves is the, the necessity for engineering. Sure. You see what I mean? There's a, a slight distinction I'm going to make there because, because I want to be uh, fair here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people have said this is a, a knife in the heart of, of of an, uh, an artificial um, intervention here. I mean, I, I wouldn't go that far. I don't think it says that. But I think what, what this is is a chipping away at the possibilities. And mm. I think what's important is to sort of to say, right, okay, there's this whole spectrum of speculation of, of how this have, could have arisen in the lab. Let's try and get to the core plausible part of that and see mm. how that stacks up against the natural origin. And... And I think one of the things that these natural receptor binding domains that target human ACE2 very efficiently does is it strips away the necessity for that mm -hmm. um, and uh, allows us to focus on a more sort of realistic um, set of um, possibilities. Right. I mean, I, I think the other thing that I think the, the, the listeners of this really need to know is this is a vast family of viruses of which we've only barely scratched the surface of our understanding of their ecology they the sequences we have and there are two major families a SARS-1 family and a SARS-2 family effectively for, for the purposes of this discussion what's very clear now is that they have been co-circulating in various subspecies of horseshoe bats for a very long time um, to the extent that they've obviously been swapping bits and pieces of their genome between each other via recombination, which means that essentially the same animal must have been infected by more than one virus. And the spike protein of these viruses is probably the most common thing that's swapped between them or parts of the spike protein. And that's completely obvious because the spike protein is what gets the virus into the cell it's also the major target for um, adaptive immune responses like antibodies. So it's going to be the most variable part of the virus. They always are. Um, and also one of the sort of features of this family is that many of these spike proteins can use different a, um, diff receptors ACE2 receptors from different species as well or better sometimes than the one they find in the in the in the, um, in the bat, and that's a that's an interesting long term evolutionary discussion. But um, but what's key about these viruses is that not only are they circulating a lot in these bats, interacting with each other, swapping bits of their genomes about, um, they are very likely to be able to spill over into a variety of mammalian species sufficiently to get a toehold to replicate to to, to uh, adapt to their host pretty pretty rapidly. And I think this is something that gets a bit lost in this discussion, is that, is that mm. these sort of spillovers probably happen a hell of a lot more than we, under, or we think, and that the selection that would allow a virus to grow out in that situation can be fairly rapid, and these changes can accumulate fairly fast. I mean, as Yuri was talking about, you know, you might only need a couple of amino acid changes in that S1, S2 junction in spike to form a furin cleavage site. That can happen very, very rapidly. I mean, I, I would imagine you could get that in a couple of passages, either, you know, in 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 a host in the, in, in in nature. So I don't... The, 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 the unlikelihood of these things is very much dependent on the selection pressure that's that's, that's exerted. What are the other, just going through sort of the, the brief bullet points, Stuart, what are your, the other key questions, do you think? Well, I think one of the major issues about the furin cleavage site that I think argues against its artificial design anyway is that it's... And, and this sort of harks towards these, these DARPA grants that were released and the, the proposals that were, were put on paper, is that um, you have a, a group of scientists who have been very interested in the risk of these viruses spilling over into humans and causing disease, because, of course, it happened in 2003 with SARS. Mm. 
and what the relative risk of that is. And in the ensuing time, they found that there's a huge diversity of these viruses circulating in, in bat populations. So one of the um, proposals in that DARPA grant is to try and understand what the what the likelihood of some of these viruses spilling over into humans is by characterizing the spike proteins of them. Um, so what they're going to do is clone them, they're going to sequence them, they're going to see whether in vitro they bind to human ACE2, or none of this is contentious in any, any shape or form. Um, and then the contentious experiments is to characterize these things in a replicating competent coronavirus. And this is where the arguments about whether this is gain of function or not gain of function come into play. Um, but the point of those experiments is to understand the nature of the spike protein. And I think what, what gets lost in this discussion is how you would go about assaying that. Um, and the way they had historically done it and the way they proposed to do it in the DARPA grant as well is to take those genes and to put them into a very well characterized or a set of well characterized viruses that we know can't be the source of SARS-CoV-2. And in those very well controlled situations, they're going to assay how those proteins function and whether they can mediate infection of human cells and pathogenesis in, human, in humanized mice. Also in that um, proposal, they would be looking for differences in the potential cleavage sites in those, in those spike proteins and whether those would be amenable to cleavage in human cells. So I sort of kind of take issue with this idea that they were going to just dump furin cleavage sites into spike proteins, because I don't think that's what the grant says. The grant says that they, that they are going to look for, um, they're going to look for viruses that have them or have the potential to have one and see if it works. Now, I, this is a distinction that I think is getting lost in the nuances that you're not gonna say, get a load of the bat viruses that don't have an obvious fear and cleavage site at the S1, S2 junction and say, ah, I'm going to stick one there. You might find one where it has one, has a sequence that looks like it could be one and it doesn't work very well. And you say, well, if I put an extra amino acid there, does it work? That's the, that's what I take from this grant. I'm not really articulated that very well, I have to say. <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm interested, Stuart, to, to really to summarise now, rather than going into the detail, like what do you think are the points at issue um, in your bullet point list? Um, so, I mean, my contention really is, is about the what we know about the natural history of these viruses, the recombination events that are happening, I think the, the, the design, if you like, of, a, of this virus doesn't seem to be very um, plausible from, a, from an engineering point of view. Um, I also think that what's missing a lot in the discussion about the circumstantial evidence is the evidence of severe amounts of cover-up and obfuscation when it comes to the wildlife trade in Wuhan. And um, that, you know, alongside that, there are certain aspects of this that we can't rule out. And a much, of, much of that is to do with what live viruses may or may not have been held in the Wuhan Institute of Virology at the time. Mm. Yeah, that seems like a good jumping off point. Um, I made two notes here. One, that often the argument that is that is used, obviously a lot of this is very technical, and when it's sort of boiled down, one of the arguments that's been said quite a lot is that this virus seemed to appear already optimised for transmissibility between humans. It wasn't just that it jumped. It seemed immensely um, 
yeah, it, it was very infectious from the from the get go, and that seems to suggest that it had been optimized for transmission before it was, um, yeah, somewhere somehow. Um, and the other question is like the narrative warfare of also like how this was framed as a conspiracy theory at the beginning and the way that that kind of storyline was manipulated, um, and whether whether yeah whether that's um, I mean that was the main reason that I was really attracted to it at the beginning was like it was clear that it was ruled out prematurely and demonized as a narrative. Um, but the transmissibility point, do you, do you think that that's valid? Um, no, because the trouble is, as with any any virus that skips into to another species and then gets a sustained transmission, you only... You, you never see the original transmission, or very rarely will you see the original transmission. It'll only have gone through a couple of passages before you actually see it. And if you think about SARS-CoV-2, remember SARS-CoV-1 is a, is a, pretty much makes everyone who gets it sick, as far as we know, really. I mean, you know, it's not very, it, it, it's not transmitted nearly as well as SARS-CoV-2, but it makes people more sick when they get it. Um, with SARS-CoV-2, do remember um, uh, that that virus or this virus, for the most part, makes people mildly or moderately sick. You know, most people don't go to hospital with a SARS-CoV-2 infection. A lot of people, we're, we're pretty sensitised to, obviously, to SARS-CoV-2 at the moment. But if you go back to um, late 2019 in respiratory virus season, are a lot of people with a mild or moderate respiratory infection going to be visible on the radar? I, I would contend that, that the reason it becomes on the radar is when it rocks up in a big city and you get so much sustained transmission that the, that the more, the sort of, the rare and more serious effects of infection get easily seen. You wouldn't have necessarily seen this in a rural population. So, the idea that it was pre-adapted is, I find, a little bit difficult if you don't, if you haven't got a very good idea of, of, of the of the earlier events. We can't, we can't really say that. The other thing is that it's very clear from the extent family that the vast majority of the genomes of all these viruses are ready to go in pretty much any mammal they can get into. So. Um, in that respect, they're what's been called quote unquote generalist viruses. And you see this in other viruses as well. I mean, filoviruses like Ebola virus are, are, are fairly generalist as well, and that they can cause fairly devastating disease in many different mammals, including us. And they don't take very much uh, encouragement to be able to do that. Hmm. So I, I, I find the pre-adapted pre -adapted, um, argument a little bit difficult because it, it, it sort of uh, doesn't really square with viral evolution as I understand it. What, what do you make of that one, Yuri? Do you still think that that's a, a piece of evidence? What is? The transmissibility, the immediate transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 when it first appeared. I don't think it's, you know, it's evidence of anything. It's, uh, it's pretty obvious that this is just a consequence of the fear and cleavage side. You put in a furin cleavage site in SARS-1, I'm sure it'll be as transmissible as SARS-CoV-2 or close to it. Um, and that's, I mean, scientists, virologists have known for a long time now that this is, furin cleavage site is what lowers the species barrier and greatly increases transmissibility. And I think it also is much better than for respiratory transmission. I think we've seen this in even as far back with the influenza, you sort of furin cleavage site well, that was the gain of function experiment in 2012, right? You have those ferrets that have a H5N1 flu virus that is not uh, transmissible through the air. And then all of a sudden it, it uh, <clears throat> gets a furin cleavage site mutation and it starts to be transmissible. And Basically it starts, sorry? It's not the only thing that matches, but, 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 the, but the, the, you're right in terms of... Um, in terms of high pathogenic avian influenza viruses, that they um, 
that the pathogenicity and transmissibility um, is associated with having a better furin cleavage site in the hemagglutinin protein. And this was known, I mean, as was discussed in 2014, like after the 2012 experiments, those gotten on the radar, those, those gain of function experiments, and people were discussing 2014, 2015, Ralph Barrick has been like in the same conference uh, as they were discussing whether they should ban gain of function research in influenza. They were discussing, you know, potential gain of function research that Ralph Barrick was doing in, with Xi Jinping in parallel. Uh, and they were also like talking about humanized mice and, and stuff like that. But coming back to the furin cleavage side, I actually, I, I found the exact quote of the DARPA grant proposal. And what they're saying is we will introduce appropriate human specific cleavage sites and evaluate growth potential in uh, mammalian cells, human airway epithelial cultures, right? So it's not, I, I mean, they're specifically saying they will insert novel cleavage sites. It's not like they were trying to make stuff that existing, evaluate existing furin cleavage sites. They're not saying exactly furin cleavage, but like human specific uh, proteases, I, I think furin is like the number one candidate on that list. So, I mean, that's why it's gotten so much kind of uproar, even in the virological community where people were like, wait a minute, minute, Peter, you didn't tell us you were going to do this. Why didn't you tell us like in 2020 that you had this proposal for DARPA and then we're just finding out about this now? I think that's why a lot of virologists even are upset with him. Well, of course. I mean, if you want to, I mean, we will analyze gene sequences for appropriately conserved proteolytic cleavage sites in S2 for the presence of potential furin cleavage sites. SARS-CoV-S with mismatches in such cleavage sites will be activated by oxygenous trypsin and cathepsin L, which is, a, which is major proteases that would activate that. Um, I mean, this is predicated on finding potential cleavage, furin cleavage sites. This isn't, you know, we're going to mm -hmm. stick one in for the hell of it. It doesn't say that in the grant, Yuri. It, it kind of seems, like my reading is, and if we don't find any, we'll insert one and we'll see if that has any effect. Like, that's how I, I would read I, that grant. Uh, well, I mean, that's my difference of, um, I mean, I, I don't read it that way, but. Okay, well, let's let's agree to disagree on that. Mm. I think one of the major um, yeah. things to sort of um, at least from the from the grant that is written is the system in which they would do that in in as well, which was one in pseudotype systems, which I'm taking to mean lentiviral pseudotype systems, because that's what uh, is generally would be the first starting point for such a I mean, it is worth, it's worth actually sort of saying how you would go about this experimentally because you're not going to make the recombinant virus straight away. You're going to clone the spike protein, sequence it, um, express it on a HIV-like virus particle that is not replication competent, it's perfectly safe, not going to function in any such way whatsoever, and see whether it works on human cells. If it doesn't work, you're not going to do anything with it. Um, you might try and activate it with a protease then. If you've sequenced it and you think, well, that looks like it could be a, a cryptic furin cleavage site and not a cathepsin L or a trypsin site, then you might say, well, okay, if I did that, would it work better? If it doesn't, you know, it goes out the window again. I, I don't accept this idea that you're just going to find something that doesn't have anything that looks like a furin cleavage site and put it in, because that's not what this grant says to me. Um, right, I mean, this, then, this grant is not... Me, one, one, last, one last point after that. Once you've done that, you do exactly what we know that they've been doing for years, which is to then put all their different spikes they want to compare with each other into an isogenic background, backbone like WIV or what they say here, SHO14 or WIV16. And in that case, then they're going to evaluate those spikes. Now, even if 
you know, we can sit here and we can argue, and I would probably agree with most of it about, you know, what's gain of function and what's not gain of function in that set of experiments I've just described. But if that's as far as it goes, nothing in that length, of, nothing in that list of experimental um, procedures would ever lead you to SARS-CoV-2. Not in this ground. You know, something like that could leak out of a lab and make someone sick and everyone would be going, oh, shit. And um, and we, to be honest, that's exactly the point that Christian Anderson, Bob Gary, um, Eddie Holmes and um, Andrew Rambo were making when they said this does not look engineered, is they were looking for evidence of spikes inserted into known backbones. Well, that's after they first said it does look engineered. <laughs> and then Christian's like... At least privately to Fauci, and then Christian like uh, putting uh, out. We can probably come into that. We can probably come into a discussion about that later. But. Right. <laughs> Coming back to the DARPA grant, yeah, I, I agree that what's written there is not a recipe for SARS-CoV-2. But knowing that you know Xi Jinping participated in that grant, and maybe at some point she or her postdocs were like looking at what else to do, how like a PhD thesis, what would be interesting. Oh, we got a new virus that we isolated. Let's create a novel backbone and maybe, you know, for additional experiments to, because you need novel, novel stuff, yeah. uh, basically kind of one up whatever previous research has done. Why don't we put a free ring, free ring cleavage site in that novel, you know, virus as well and see whether that makes a difference? Considering that in 2019 in Beijing, in, they did the same thing in the chicken coronavirus and they put in RRKR. RRAR, you know, Xi Jinping's team found RRAR in 2017 and then the other uh, expeditions, like three different coronaviruses, alpha, though. But, but, but like, for Yuri, I mean, this is a nerdy point, but RRKR is a, is a, is a consensus furin site. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's kind of close. But, you know, it, it, but, it, is, and it is. I mean, I mean, this is I, I think this is a point is, is if you want to look at whether your furin cleavage site is going to do anything, you're going to put a decent furin cleavage site in it. You're not going to put one that you think, oh, well, I'm not sure that will work. You know, you're going to put a consensus in because you want the furin cleavage to happen. And this is sure. the struggle. If with you want it to happen, yes. If you try to model what would happen during recombination with an alpha virus that has an RRAR, you know, you could put an RRAR. And by the way, coming back, like, I mean, I, it's not a it's not a strong point by any means. It's just one of the hypotheses what could have happened. And obviously, this is not one to kind of die on, put up as a you know your banner to die on. But um, it's an interesting point that. Uh, why do we see an insertion? You're absolutely right that it would be very easy to, much easier to a virus to obtain a novel furin cleavage site by just point mutations. It just, it would take one, two, three nucleotides. If you want a polybasic, like three or four nucleotides would have to mutate just a single, because the first R is already there. So all it takes for a furin cleavage site to arise is to get an R, you know, three or four amino acids down. Like it depends on which one you count, which one you don't. So, it, it's much easier to arise by point mutations, but for some reason we see this very weird insertion, which kind of implies that this was probably happening in a system that already anyway had some sort of negative selective pressure against furin cleavage sites. I, I, I'm concerned that we're going w <laughs> way down into the weeds for the for the viewers, um, and I'm wondering if we could take it up a level in terms of. Um, I mean, I wonder whether there's a conversation we can have about what the key pieces of ne necessary evidence or the key pieces of missing evidence are that we could kind of maybe agree on. Um, I mean, I say, David, or, or, or even, or even, what do you think of the extreme positions from the lab leak perspective that you would both agree are not supported by the evidence or or are disproved by the evidence? Those those two questions, I think, are kind of a little more graspable. Well, I think bioweapon can go out the window <laughs> pretty safely. <laughs> going out the window i mean they, it makes absolutely zero sense to me to make a coronavirus into a bioweapon yeah um, that much i think we agree upon <laughs> um, I, also, I also struggle with this notion that it's the product of some sort of attenuated vaccine program as well um because I don't, I mean, if you take the DARPA grant, 
which actually proposes for some sort of vaccination or immunotherapy to prevent spillover from bats, then it's none crazy. of that. Yeah. <laughs> we can argue about whether we think that's a good, good strategy or not. That's a different matter. Mm-hmm. But what it doesn't propose is using some sort of attenuated replication competent coronavirus to achieve that. And I don't think I would like to, I certainly would like to think that no one would be mad enough to do that because the, the risk of reversion would be would be um would be too great. I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone looking at that grant would would say, ah that proposed to do that would 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 say you know i don't think you should do that i think you know uh, and you would have no control over it and no you know i think i think people need to get across need to be, get across that you know virologists who work on viruses to try and understand how they make people sick and stop them happening they don't work on them usually we hope to make them worse and and let them go without any idea of what they're going to do so so I, I struggle with that. You wouldn't, and and to be honest, we have such good platforms for expressing the spike proteins in heterologous systems that would stimulate the sort of immune responses you want in a vaccine that you would never ever consider those sort of platforms anymore, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, like the DARPA proposal was, I, I think even in, in its form was pretty crazy that they're going to take, uh, you know, some sort of, dangerous bat virus and create a vaccine, a non-replicating vaccine, and then just go around caves and, you know. But they weren't going to do that. Were they? they weren't going to do that. Well, That's, I mean. They were going to either, what they've got written there is either to make um, some form of um, lipid-based microparticle aerosol containing recombinant protein of the spike proteins of those viruses, so completely yeah. uh, completely replication deficient, or they were going to take a pox virus base vector encoding those spike proteins as a delivery vehicle, which is a system that's been used for years and years and years for vaccinating um, wild animals against rabies. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I the, said. The, the platform is not mad. I mean, I think the, the idea that you could maybe suppress virus in a population like that um, and not, you know, selective funky things happening is a uh, is 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 a different question. But <laughs> yeah, I think that grant was never really meant to be like turned into a actual like working vaccination program. It was just meant to get the funding, and they would just you know go and, and experiment and spend those fourteen million and happily report that yeah we got it. But then. When time would actually come for like China would have to authorize like you know DARPA funded research to go in their caves and <laughs> inoculate their bats like th- that would never have happened. But I mean the other I mean, th- the other thing to sort of just I don't know we you know because how do we know we did that DARPA grant very very clearly says where all this molecular virology was going to happen and all the contentious molecular virology that has been very controversial in that grant was very, very specifically said to take place at the University of North Carolina. There was no proposed grant to do any of that spike engineering, recombinant virus work anywhere else other than UNC. WIV's role was to sample the bats, sequence them, make recombinant proteins, look at the ACE2 interaction, in fact, like, live bats. In, in fact, live bats. In, oh, well, that was... The IV. But, and, but also, what were they going to infect the live bats with? Well, I don't know, the viruses that they were studying. They were going to infect it with WIV1, and they were going to yeah. do it as a proof of yeah. principle. But I'm that, not, that yeah, was, that was, that grand that was like, such no, an no. aspirational part of the grant. There was no way that anyone's got that far yet. <laughs> right and of course i mean this is a darpa grant they're selling yeah. it to american military they're not going to say that most of the kind of dual research uh, dual uh, capacity work is going to be done in china they're saying yeah it's all going to be done at home yeah ralph barrick blah 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 but obviously this is this is not you know rocket science wiv can do all the same stuff just as well it's not but there's a lot of I mean, this is. I, I, I worry. I worry. There's about three or four people in the world who can probably follow the conversation. <laughs> um, I mean, we're not. Well, I, I, how I we can, 
I think how, how, it, how we can how we can broaden it out. Right. To, okay. Well, then I'll, I'll probably say it like this in terms of so a lot of the contentious stuff that people are arguing about between sort of people who favour a, a natural zoonosis versus a lab leak is not that the stuff that is being proposed by the lab leak proponents is impossible. It all can be done. It's all theoretically fairly facile. But in terms of the manpower and um, sheer amount of work and time that work would take to do, and the pitfalls that would happen along the way, um, some of what is being proposed and sort of um, put forward as being likely scenarios from someone who actually works in a virological lab and understands how you would go about actually doing these practically really strikes me as very implausible. I actually like this is one point I wanted to discuss because yeah it, like this is something I think Chris Kavanaugh in in his podcast with you took like you said oh it just takes a few weeks and he thought that means it's impossible but again this is just uh, you know things like this are take weeks for a qualified vir vir virology student or you know postdoc it's not out of the realm of possibility if someone was starting to do this work in 2018 doing it in 2019 that you know parallel teams could have been working with different groups of viruses that one of those could have led to you know some of them gotten infected by either something they've been working on or mm -hmm. as we said like a f from field work where they sample hundreds of bats potentially hundreds of viruses getting infected i don't think this is in any way kind of out of the realm of possibility or a hard thing well, to exactly so this is but but this is also where i say right okay what what i find at the extreme that i think is probably less likely is all the engineering stuff if we bring it back to people culturing viruses in a lab under appropriate or inappropriate containment levels inappropriate because uh, they sold two for them was enough or for bad yeah, I mean, that, that's Obviously, fairly nobody, unclear to you, me bits would be done where but 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 um and certainly historically maybe but but more recently i think all of that has been done at bsl3 well yeah um, <laughs> after the outbreak no outbreak. no prior to that prior to that oh, oh okay um as, as i understand it i mean you know i've been there so i don't know but <laughs> but, but i think there's that's the more sort of likely side of things because, you know, a lot of the engineering sort of experiments that we've been talking about, what does this site do in this virus when we put it in or else or otherwise, requires a sort of a reinvention of the wheel for, for experimental systems that could theoretically end up being SARS-CoV-2, which strikes me as being implausible because as a scientist, if you want to answer a question, you're going to use the most robust system you have, the most robust um, set of reagents you have um, to cut down on the variability of your experiment. So why would you say, well, I've got this backbone. I'm going to look at what happens to this spike when I do this in this backbone rather than I'm going to make a completely different backbone and do all the stuff again that I was doing in these backbones, in this backbone. And someone will say, well, why are you wasting your time? Why don't you just use what you had already? Well, what if you're a PhD student and you're getting trained? I mean, this sounds like a task. Uh, that's, yeah. that's just not a... So just to, just to decode what you, what you just said, Stuart. So are you saying that the they would use pieces they already had rather than new combinations of new pieces? Well, if you want to ask the question about the nature of a spike protein, for example, you want to cut out every other variable in that experiment, right? If you start throwing in different backbones all the time, now you've got a whole different set of variables of context dependency, of trying to understand what bits fit together where. You've got a nice, robust system where things can be slotted in and out, uh, 
know that those viruses replicate, you know which cells you can do it in, you know which animal model you're going to use. Yeah. And all the answer to all the questions you want to know about that spike protein can all come out of that set of experiments. Yeah. The amount of effort it would take to then transpose all of those experiments into a whole different set of backgrounds for very little rationale strikes me as making being a very implausible experimental strategy. Well, we're not talking really anymore about anybody kind of splicing in an RB, RBD into a backbone. Now we know the RBD can be actually, you know, part of the natural virus. Well, so, so this, the this, question they might have been ask, answering was, what if you insert a novel cleavage site into this virus? What will the, the implications would be? So requires you to sort of identify these viruses, have made the molecular clones, have already validated in another system what would be the consequences of doing that because you know making these sort of mutations you know they are possible you know we there are all the tools but they are not trivial things to do if you can answer the question a different way i mean you, you know four weeks six weeks to make once you know once you actually let's let's break this down you can sequence the entire virus you can make your reverse genetic system the, um, to reconstruct it in the lab. The amount of time it takes to get from there to infectious virus with that is going to be very variable. Well, order of weeks to a couple of months, three months, maybe. Maybe, maybe, with a fair wind behind. Oh, it's not years. Yeah, no, not years. If you, if you, if you know what you, if you're good at it, Maybe that that let's sort of length of time, and then every time you want to make a mutation and get that virus growing and characterize it, that takes another few weeks as well at the at the very best. You know, yeah. For a lot of those questions you want to answer about what happens if you put a furin cleavage site in a spike protein, you know, I could do those experiments in three days, four days in a lentiviral system and get the same bloody answer. Now you tell me which one you're going to waste your lab reagents and your and your and your um, resources on. Well, you can't do it in vivo, right? You actually need to it, but at least you have a predication for doing it. Maybe. And with it, and in vivo, you would you you would maybe want to use the well characterized background because you already know that goes nicely in the mice. You already know that that causes disease, and what you're looking at is the nature of the spike and how the spike alters that pathogenesis now you know this is this is irrespective of gain of function i'm talking about sort of rationale for an experiment is right. that you know you don't know whether the other novel backbones have restriction points in them that mean they won't go well in your chosen experimental model okay what if you had a vaccine candidate or therapeutic that he wanted to test against a wide range of potential you know uh, viruses I, it would depend on what, what the target was but as far as we know at the moment the only thing anyone's ever been interested in has been the spike protein right but i mean she generally has been working on this fusion peptide or fusion prevention peptide and it's yeah. possible that she was kind of you know looking for other viruses to test it against and also the possibility that what if the virus evolves a furin cleavage site how will that affect the efficacy of her peptide will it still but, prevent but that, but that can all be accommodated within the within the within the wiv1 chimera that's the, the beauty of it because all of those things are directed against the spike you don't need the the, the whole point of having these chimeric viruses on this background is so you don't have to bugger about with all these different um, potential live viruses that you have to clone and for the only amount of time it takes. You've got this beautiful system you can slot things in and out of. Now, I know people don't like this system, but, but, but it's still a system that you would use because it's easy and it gives you the answer you want. And particularly if you're talking about anything that's directed vaccine-wise against the spike protein or drugs that are directed against the spike protein, then that's exactly the system you would choose because it's 
beautifully controlled. You know where you are with it. And yes, it's obviously thrown up a couple of surprises in terms of the pathogenesis in a couple of these things, as we've found out recently. But but at least you know where you're at. And, and, and you can also, you've got a virus that's particularly sensitive to certain potentially antiviral drugs that you can be a bit if you're smart you can actually make it a bit a bit safer system as well which i think we could both agree would be wise if you're going to do this maybe you would want to put a a sort of a sensitizing mutation in your backbone such that it's uh, more easy to kill with something <laughs> else it's, it's yuri, yuri what do you think is the most likely um scenario you you know do you, do you agree that engineering is is less likely or? Um, I don't know. I, I think there's just so many different scenarios that are possible within the lab leak kind of hypothesis. Starting from yes, engineering in in the context of I like uh, drug development. Obviously, is something that you know I, I do. So I, I'm thinking as a drug developer, and as a drug developer, you actually want to test as wide a repertoire as of like insults against your your drug or vaccine. So from a researcher standpoint, you can be like, yeah, I can just use the same backbone for all of my research. But then as a drug developer or as a like a regulatory agency, you're thinking, oh, but you only tested your vaccine against just one backbone. Why don't you test it against a wide range of naturally found viruses? So this could be like, you know, what could have led to SARS-CoV-2 could have been just one of dozens of candidates, if not hundreds of candidates against coronavirus candidates against which a potential vaccine or therapeutic was tested, you know, in, in, in model systems. Uh, another uh, hypothesis is, just, yeah, it's just a natural virus that was collected and infected someone without them knowing, or maybe they were trying to um, culture it and, uh, you know, out of the <clears throat> a viral sample, like a anal swab or whatever, they were trying to actually get the live virus, which would they, they could propagate, characterize, et cetera. And maybe during the process of culturing, uh, it could have gotten the furin cleavage side and became become so much more infectious that the BSL-2 procedures under which they worked were no longer sufficient to guarantee that humans won't, won't get infected with it. Uh, I mean, there's so many different scenarios, but I, I find it extremely unlikely that a virus would make its way into Wuhan without the Wuhan Institute of Virology or any other scientists around in Wuhan having something to do with it. I mean, the chances of that is just astronomically small. It's possible, but like to me, like when you're saying it's 90% likely that that's what happened, it's just a, such a huge coincidence that but, I don't know well, how. You've got very, very clear evidence of extensive um, sale of live suscept coronavirus susceptible species in Wuhan up until autumn. Oh, and Wuhan is not the biggest place. Like you, you go to the south, they eat all kinds of yeah, weird shit. Maybe so, maybe so. But you do have that. You have um the the wholesale clearing out of all of that prior to all investigation. You have no testing, no zero testing of relevant animals that were potentially on sale in that time. None of this 80,000 animal test stacks up as being at all relevant when you have zoo animals, chickens, pigs. None of these are relevant. You know, the only relevant things that were ever tested was a few frozen carcasses in the one unmarked. Everything else was cleared out, right? No one found a damn thing. Are you sure? I mean, I, I think there were two different groups of samples, like 30,000, 40,000. I, I thought they tested some of the, like, wildlife samples and, sold. Yeah, from various places around China that were, um, some of them were very historical. Some of them were from the zoo. <laughs> it's zoonotic, right? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. But I mean, the less no, but, uh, it's, like, it's likely to find them there. And, I mean, and, and I think it's right. possible, but just it's very unlikely. Like, in all places in China. It just, happened before. I mean, it's happened before, and and the the trouble 
is is that you know it's totally unpredictable you know yes you might say well you're more likely to have it happen in a in a city where there's more of these markets yeah absolutely granted but you have these things moving across all of southeast asia the huge huge trade in these things. exactly moving across but it happened a very localized outbreak in wuhan why aren't we finding you know some other like progenitors or outbreaks in other places well, in, have, uh, concurrently have, like have this, we looked so this well, mutation it, happened it, Wuhan, but right? This, but this is isn't this exactly what Eco Health Alliance was set up to try and answer? <laughs> I mean, their whole remit was to try and predict the um, the likelihood of overspill by trying to get an idea of the ecology of these viruses in their host species and where they may or may not come into contact with humans and they've been doing a lot of research across the whole area i mean building up you know whether you like their mathematical or model or not i mean they're they're coming to the conclusion that sort of tens to hundreds of thousands of potential contacts between humans and bat viruses every year and 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 the vast majority of those will never go anywhere beyond a single dead end infection exactly because yeah. human human to human needs uh, of your cleavage site so the one that makes it through, the one that ends up in a conurbation where you actually end up seeing it, is always going to have the attributes that make it really good at this. Yes, for it's sure. It's not, that's not the question. The question is why, I mean, what are the chances of that, you know, happening in the same place that have been studying these things? And, yeah, well, it's just very, very low probability and coupled with everything else the behavior and the history and just like this very close proximity of this very same pathogen to the pathogens that they've been studying okay well but, but you, I, don't know. I mean they have i mean you know we can you know the trouble is is we end up in a situation where we we hit this roadblock because we don't know, and they, we, they've been asked the question, they said no, you know, you would contend they must be lying. I say, well, how can we contend that they're lying or not? I, I mean, I, I'm not... Given, to, to give an example, I mean, famously, the, there was a cover-up in China, the BBC team that tried to get to the Mojiang mine was blocked from going there. Like, certainly they behave like there has been something to hide from the beginning. Is that not the case? In terms of blocking off that mine, I mean, well, let's. I mean, if you, if you if you accept the history, I think we we all do that. You know, there was at least a potential for these miners to have been infected with the Sabika virus. Um, that mine became quite a cause celebre in China. Various groups sampled it and pulled out quite a lot of different types of viruses, not just coronaviruses and not just the WIV. Um, you know, I certainly wouldn't want, you know, numb nuts BBC journalists stomping in there and walking out and coughing on people. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, as a, I, I certainly would want to protect that um, cave from people trespassing in it. Um, now, with you, whether you go to the sort of levels that the Chinese have gone to, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, it's not somewhere where you just want the general public going into. <laughs> yeah, but they there was all of this stuff about them breaking down lorries in front of the BBC. Yeah, that was very weird. And like the the whole thing. I mean, there, there was a level of, of of secrecy and cover up from the beginning. I think I think you can also make the argument that this is what what looks like cover up in China and is cover up in China may not necessarily mean that they have that they're hiding this specific. Um, that it was definitely engineered or it was definitely a lab leak. It's also the case that the local government is trying to kind of avoid responsibility for Beijing. It's a it's a dictatorship where if you're left, if you're feeling exposed, you will you will do anything to kind of avoid responsibility. Like the, the fact that it looks like a, the fact that there is definitely duplicitous behavior and um a cover-up doesn't necessarily mean they're covering up the thing that we're assuming that they're covering up. That, that, that's that's the thing. I think there's 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 an equal amount of um, uh, plausibility for them to cover up any 
anything that would suggest that they have some responsibility for the um, the pandemic, either not um, taking it seriously early enough or it being the result of some sort of overspill in a, in a market or some sort of aspect of the wildlife trade that they knew about and didn't stop and was known to be illegal and local local apparatchiks are turning a blind eye to and then when when the proverbial hits the fan um their first reaction is to try and make sure they don't get into trouble with their hires i mean this is how these dictatorships work i mean the 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 whole point is is just not to get in trouble because you're the you know and 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 so i think that the the actual sort of the evidence that that the obfuscation and and cover up that we have implies a particular source. I think that that there's a problem there because you know I think they'd be like that about anything. What do you think about that, Yuri? I mean, definitely has a point that you know it could be the kind of their default. Ammo just to cover up everything, just in case, because it, it could be the case that maybe even the Wuhan authorities or Chinese authorities don't trust the scientists, and they think like maybe they're lying, and they it was a lab leak, but we, we better cover it up so that we don't get in trouble. It's possible. So, but like the way they go about it, and the scientists themselves, the WIV scientists, like how they're behaving. In, for example, the RATG 13 and not telling the backstory, like if they were certain that this is a completely natural freak accident, they wouldn't be behaving this way. I don't think so. Like the way, as I said, the behaving is not consistent with scientists trying to establish what the hell really happened. It's consistent with them actually trying to cover up a lab leak and like destroying samples, uh, very like a gag order very very early early on on like saying anything about the the lab league has to be uh, not lab league uh, anything about SARS-CoV-2 has to be that's that's across China though isn't it that's not just (laughs) WIV I mean yeah ultimately it it, it became that's because I mean you know whether you agree with it or not you can probably at least understand that a government of the nature that exists in China will want to be very, very careful about the message that's getting out. And in the first phases, I mean, there was so much rubbish that was coming out on preprint servers that ended up having to be withdrawn because it was just total nonsense and dangerously stupid in many respects. HIV inserts? You're, yeah, you're for- <laughs> that, that one. That's, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. They, they got uh, Xi Jinping blood boiling. She's like, they shut their rotten mouths or something. <laughs> I think that's why, released, that's why they released RATG 13. I think in response to that preprint, she was like releasing RATG 13 to quell those rumors that they're HIV inserts, just to show that they occur naturally. Though, those. Well, maybe so. I mean, right. I think the, the, I mean, the backstory about the Mojang mine is, I think, is probably the thing I found the most, you know, as, as much as I've disagreed with the interpretation that may have come out of Drastic, I've still found it a very fascinating story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I fully, I'm fully on board with the idea that there's pretty good circumstantial evidence that these miners had a coronavirus infection, even if they then subsequently died of a secondary fungal infection. <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, that's what, Delta was doing in India, right? A lot of people had the secondary fungal infections. So, I mean, but I'm also fairly comfortable with the notion that the but between the theses that um, that were uncovered and what Lin Fa Wang has said, I mean, you would probably have a have a different opinion of of what he says than I do. But <laughs> that, 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 that there was there was at least some serological evidence to point towards a coronavirus infection. There was no PCR evidence in 2012 using the existing diagnostics that would suggest there was any any coronavirus that they could detect in um, respiratory swabs. That's written in those theses. Um, they, yeah, but um, I, I- IgM and IgGs and, uh, and IgM IgGs. We we can talk about you can we can talk about how good or bad serological assays can be, but there were certainly indications. It right. does strike me that 
they never could nail it and they could never nail it in a way that was satisfied. You know, they went back, they, they've obviously harvest, harvested bat samples. They never found SARS-1 like in the cave, which is what they were looking for, I think. I don't, wow. think, I don't think there's any, I'm not, as I understand it, one of the problems was is they did find obviously this little group of coronavirus is typified by rat TG13, which, yeah. until, which until 2018, as far as we know, only existed as 300 base pair PCR sequences from which to draw a phylogenetic tree to show that they were distinct from the SARS-1 family. And they were focused on the SARS-1 family. And I really think that the, the reason why this sort of was sat in the WIV was until 20, 2019, these viruses were just not bloody interesting because they were not SARS-1. And when you sequence a spike, when you know when the spike of SARS-1 interacts with human ACE2, and you know what you're looking for in the contact points, these viruses look different and you wouldn't necessarily predict that a priori. And I just think that this, the, the, the evidence that was uncovered of these theses being master's theses or a PhD thesis in collaboration with somebody else suggests to me that these were just low priority things in the lab. That, you know, if they had enough hands at a time they would break out and say, you know, have a look at this, see if there's anything interesting there. And that's then that's how it went until they get their um, Illumina machine in 2018 and decide to give it a run out on some of these samples. And then, and then you have, and then we what we don't know, and I and I it, oh, clearly RAT TG13 was sequenced in 2018. Initially. We started in 17 initially. All right, I can plug the machine in there. <laughs> <laughs> like the first amplicon dates are 17, I think. Yeah, okay. August, maybe. But yeah. there is probably a lot of downstream reanalysis of that. They had to build a consensus sequence out of those, about out of those reads. Um, and, you know, the, the question is, is, did the first person who did it do it very well or was it revisited when it, when it, when it, when the uh, homology to SARS-CoV-2 turned up? Yeah, we, we will probably never know that. But we, what we do know is that they actually worked on uh, 4991, as it was known at the time, before they renamed it for no particular reason and didn't explain it very well or didn't even mention they renamed it in 2020 to RHEG13. This is really weird. They didn't even cite their own paper. Well, okay. uh, yeah, are, there, are there any parts, Stuart, Stuart, are there any parts of the behavior that you find suspicious? There was I the, do find that the, odd, certainly. I mean, I don't, I think it's it's pretty odd that they didn't refer back to that paper, that virologic, so just for the, for the, for the uninitiated, um, the virus sequence, the big or, or the partial virus sequence that was subsequently sequenced as a full genome that became RATG13 was sequenced and published in a paper in 2016 in a journal called Virologica Sinica, um, amongst a group of other viruses, and, and and as far as we know, never really characterised further than that. Um, now, when you say so, so, Yuri, when you say working on as far as I understand it, until that virus genome was sequenced 2017-18, all that was ever used for was as just another sequence in the tree. So, you know, working on... They characterized the N gene, I think. The N okay. gene in 2014, there was a, another master's thesis that worked on... Right. Yeah, yep, yep, you're right. I've forgotten about that. Yeah. Okay. And, uh... So what they're looking at there is to make better... You know, the point of that thesis was to make better diagnostic immunoassays yeah. to detect spillover infections if they Something happen to. They did. Picking up spiders, you know, yeah, that kind of <laughs> rings a bell, doesn't it? No. And, yeah. and but, that, but then again, that's just, but that's not, that's not growing the virus. That's not reconstructing the virus and, and working on it. Well, that's a whole different issue. You're like be quite careful about what we know that they were doing and not necessarily impute that because they were doing X, 
they must have done Y because doing Y requires a whole bunch of other people to do it as well. And remember that the whole point of their research program was to the risk of what at the time, remember prior to 2019, all anyone cared about was SARS-1-like viruses. No one had ever heard about SARS-2-like viruses. The SARS-1-like viruses were always the present danger. And if you and if you wanted to understand, so every project, every priority project in that lab was obviously going to be directed that way because that's where the big papers were. I mean, sure. this is the bit that I understand about about the Mojang miners themselves is that if they had isolated or identified a novel SARS-like virus in those miners, then why the hell didn't they publish it? I mean, if well, they, they had enough data to say, you know, we got this sequence out of these people, you know? I mean, that in itself is a nature paper at the time. And, you know, the well, they probably didn't get it out science of science is being measured exactly the same way as Western science. You know, all they care about is their nature papers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So probably they didn't have uh, the like they couldn't extract anything out of the human samples, and they they were maybe like mocking about with bad samples. But the thing that for me is a very uh, telling is that they've been working on this four nine nine one for years, many groups, but they still haven't published it until the outbreak of the pandemic. Like to all those people saying like, oh, if they had this backbone, SARS-CoV-2 like backbone, they would have published it. Why would they kind of sit on it? The answer is, well, why did they sit on RATG-13 and never told the world? This is, but this is only sequence data, isn't it? There's nothing, Sorry. it's only sequence data. Right, I mean, but like who knows how many other viruses they've been working on but, but all of all the, the world doesn't know about. But to get to that point, I mean, the, Yes, you say working on, quote unquote. Okay, but let, let's be clear about what would have generated the data that has come out about these things. I mean, that is taking a bat sample, dumping RNA later in it to inactivate everything so you can extract the RNA and sequence the cDNA that you make from it, right? There is no need to culture or um, isolate virus from those samples to get that information and in terms of a of a risk to being infected from that sample when doing that that's probably the lowest risk exercise of the whole shebang right no i'm not talking about that particular kind of work the kind of work that could have gotten infected people infected would be resurrecting a live virus, right? Culturing a live virus. Yeah, absolutely, obviously. absolutely. That's that's can the do most risky. The most two in parallel. Thing. You can do like one person does the sequencing and inactivates everything with RNA later, and some other group actually tries to culture the virus. And yeah, but you're not going to do that until you've got all the sequence and analyzed it, are you? Well, if you might, because you might not have enough virus to to sequence, and you might you you try to culture and actually see like what to then later. To sequence later, you try to culture it first. Well, the could. way it's going to go is you're going to have all these, all these samples. You're going to take. I mean, let's let's be conservative. You think, well, you know, I want to be able to preserve some of this sample in case I want the virus out of it. If if there is some, the first thing you're going to do is take a bit of it, inactivate it, do a PCR to see if there is any detectable. 300 base pair chunk of the virus, which is their primary screening tool. Right, okay. Everything that doesn't have that goes in the bin, although will be listed in that database. <laughs> right, fine. The database. You've got that. You've got these, you now you've got, and, and, and they clearly say in this DARPA grant, when they do this, and, and this is backed up by various people who, who have done bat sampling in the Chinese area, you get about 5 to 10% positivity. Mm -hmm. right, okay, so right. Now, the vast majority of those samples are not going to have anything that you've got a prayer of getting out. So in turn, you know, you're much more likely to go for the sequencing option to say, right, okay, let's see what's there full genome wise. Is there anything interesting? Or is this just essentially a whole bunch of stuff that we already know? Yeah, okay. And at that point, it's like, well, 
okay, shall we uh, then try and isolate this virus or not? And uh, But when you've got the whole genome sequence, as you said earlier, you know, it's very hit and miss. I mean, you know, to be base about this, I mean, you've got a, you've got a, um, you've got a sample that's just basically taken from a swab up a back's backside, mm-hmm. right? You know, it may have coronavirus in it, but it's going to have, have a hell of a lot of other stuff in it as well. <laughs> but it's going to make your life difficult if you try and culture it. And you have to put, I mean, I know this because I've got plenty of people in my lab who culture SARS-CoV-2 out of respiratory samples of people who are of very high levels of virus. And, you know, you're stacking the deck in favour of isolating the virus in those. And even then, it's not always trivial because there's a lot of other stuff that will, you know, kill your culture before you ever get the virus out of it, unless you're particularly careful. So, um, and also what seems to be the case certainly and, and is attested to by various people is that as far as we know, the viral loads in the samples that you get from bats are generally pretty low. There's not a lot, probably not a lot of infectious virus there. So I think this probably accounts for why Zhu Seng Li says we only managed to isolate three viruses. It's not that, the, you know, it's because it's hard, because even if you can detect it, your chances of getting the live virus out of the sample are fairly low. Well, yeah, and then maybe that's why you're better off actually doing full genome sequencing, creating a backbone, like reverse genetic systems, and then just, you know, resurrecting it that way instead of culturing it. But, but, but actually, it's exactly what they've done. They've gone, right, okay, let's sequence the damn thing, right? Okay, well, what are we most interested in? Spike, right? Okay, because that's going to define whether it can get into human cells or not. Then, right, now we've got these spike sequences. What are we going to do with them? I know. We're going to clone them into this system so we can work on them because, you know, it's going to be a real pain in the backside to try and resurrect them out of this if we don't need to. So, you know, effectively, that's the last bit of the pathway if you ever want to get that far. And you may not even need to get that far. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's always... My argument on this is, is intensely scientifically practical rather than theoretical because I don't disagree with you that... that all of these things are theoretically possible. And if you had an army of a thousand people in your lab, all dedicated at the bench, you could do everything you wanted. And every and every every sort of combination and and um, potential plausible scenario could happen in you know drastic world if you had everybody with all these different <laughs> who were able to do all these things at the same time. But when you've got limited resources, when you've only got 20 odd people in the lab, which she does, when you've got other projects going on as well, because she doesn't just work on coronaviruses, <laughs> um, then uh, then you're going to pick your battles, aren't you? And you're well, going to pick your battles her, to get the information you want. As I said, she was very careful to say it didn't come from my lab. <laughs> 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 Left the door open. It could have come from someone else's lab. In, in and also, why, and if you, and if you are totally, totally um, self-sufficient again about doing all of these things, why are you seeding all of this to the Barrett Lab at UNC in the DARPA grant to do all of this procedure for you? She's not seeding anything. Like I, I think it's like she's being used by EcoHealth. She doesn't need EcoHealth. EcoHealth needs her, her to get the funding and like because she's the gatekeeper to China and Chinese caves. Yeah. Without her, EcoHealth is dead. Not the only one. Not the only one. There's a, there's well, a, okay. um, so I, mean, I, didn't. I think we're we're slightly over time, so I'm thinking to 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 maybe sort of summarize. I think both of you would agree that well, you're, you're saying that there's no there's no sort of proof either way. You can make a case for for either either, but you weight it differently. What do you think? Right. Firstly, what do you think are the key pieces of evidence that are needed to resolve this question one way or another? Um, yeah, that would change things fundamentally. I I, I think the trouble is, yeah, I. I you know, ultimately, we need to know, we need to know exactly what was in the freezers at the WIV. I mean, the the I trouble is, 
<laughs> I mean, we and we can completely agree with that. The trouble is, is that the well has been poisoned as in as much, and not just not accusing anybody of doing that necessarily because it's got so intensely political. Yeah, but um, I don't think no matter what they say they have, even if they put everything out on the table, you know, they're not going to be believed by people who already have decided that the lab leak is the most likely scenario. Because I can guarantee you, if, if, if Xi Jinping turns up and said, right, here, here's my database, this is everything I have, they are, knock yourselves out, you're not going to find SARS-CoV-2 in there or a progenitor. And then when you get to that point, how are you going to interpret that bit of data? Are you going to say, well, yep, yeah, oh, fair cop, you know, that's all right. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying. <laughs> or, are you, or are you going to say, or are you going to say, well, you know, it's not there because you've just deleted that bit of the data? <laughs> right. I think you have to actually prove that the other way you have to prove zoonosis by providing the animal, the intermediate host, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, like, uh, not obviously, I mean, a plausible scenario of how it got to Wuhan and why we didn't see it before. I mean, it's still possible. I mean, and maybe Which, we'll see it, and they'll like, prove that it's like completely exonerate the lab. That's still po possible, right? If but, if that happens, sure. Yeah, but can you think of anything that, in your mind? Well, uh, then then follow that through a little bit. In your mind, sure. what would exonerate the lab? What would what bit of data would say? You know, that's it. I'm done. I've completely shifted my perspective. We find a pangolin with a SARS-CoV-2 progenitor with a furin cleavage site. And maybe not even in Wuhan, but it's some, some sort of like wildlife trade, maybe a dead pangolin that's been seized by customs sitting in some warehouse in Guangdong. That, and part of that shipment, like later we trace that made it to Wuhan. But what, and, and what, if, it was, and what if it was an overspill from a bat that may be, be infected with a, a virus very like the Laotian virus, where you've got one or two amino acids that are only needed to make a furin cleavage site, and that happened in the first couple of passages after a human overspill in a fairly remote place that you're never going to ever find. Oh no, I'm not. There's definitely scenarios that will when we will never know. Like it's it's possible we'll never know because we'll never find that. Like if it's not a lab leak. It's a huge coincidence. It's possible we'll never know that it was zoonotic because like all the missing links are gone and will never never to be found. It's it's possible this will never be an unanswered question. But I'm just kind of answering David's question, what would you need to see? What kind of evidence you'd need to see to like case closed? This is you know not a lab leak. Conversely, there's so much evidence potentially possible to case closed, it's a lab leak. A whistleblower, uh, I don't know, we find something else in metagenomic data sets that's like, oh, whoops, see, like WIV had this, I don't know, yep. RBM receptor binding domain back in. So. And, I, and, I, and I can guarantee you if that sort of turns up and it's suddenly like, ah, well, that changes everything. You know, if, if that happens, then, you know, not my last number, right? So I'm not. Uh, you know, if that if that evidence arrives, then you know I, I can't argue against it. Um, I think the problem is is that it took to, you know if you think back to the SARS one epidemic, they got lucky because the animals were still in the market and the epidemiology traced it back to the market fairly quickly. Yeah, it was like a now at the week. moment, you know, still as far as we know, the the biggest epidemiology in Wuhan points towards the market areas. No. You know? yeah. Page patients sick before the market without any access to the market. And actually first patient no, no, on the other side no. of the river. You got one person, the only proof of that is he did his shopping at the local supermarket and says he didn't go to the market. You know, there's no, no, there's no evidence that he didn't interact with someone who did have it. I mean, we're talking about a whole bunch of people who will probably have had fairly mild or or maybe asymptomatic infections. And do remember, people who are coming to and from, if you, if you look at the SARS-1 history, then the animal handlers that were bringing those civets to the Guangdong markets, 
mm. were 50% seropositive for antibodies against SARS-CoV-1, even though most of them didn't report ever being sick. Exactly, because antibodies don't mean you got infected. It just means you've been exposed. Same logic. Or, yeah. That's, you know, the bad logic of RP3 using as a map marker of seropositivity in the whole of South- Southeast Asia, as Peter Daszak tries to sell you. Just because you got six farmers with antibodies doesn't mean they got sick. It doesn't mean the no. virus got to their cells. It no, just no means- it doesn't mean. It means they've been exposed, and he's very careful yeah. with those words. But also what that means is because of the, the, the fluctuations in antibody levels, we know that that, 6%, or that small number, 3%, whatever, 6%, must be an underestimate. They can't be an overestimate. Mm. Um, so so these, this is happening far more than you think it is. And also, if you are in a situation where you might be regularly exposed to these viruses, then you've got some pre-existing immunity, haven't you? Which, sure. in effect, what happens to, say, me as someone who's been vaccinated, meeting Delta, I'll get infe- potentially get infected with it. I might be productively infected with it. I ain't going to get sick in all likelihood. So it's very possible that people coming to and from these places, big cities, with their loads, you know, if they are going to be infected themselves, could well be less likely to be sick than the completely naive population they find themselves in. And this is where the desperately difficult to sort of say, you know, this must be the routine, because there are so many ways it could have come in, and none of them are mutually exclusive. Um, so, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. <laughs> I think David is now. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if either of you have <laughs> summar- summaries um, to finish with. Whether you've shifted from your ninety ninety five percent on either side. <laughs> well, I mean, if I was to start, I don't really think you know. Neither mine, <laughs> no Stuart's position, really changed through this discussion. But I, I think we. At least maybe opened up some some novel kind of avenues of uh, not necessarily investigation, but the new data that we might be on the lookout for, uh, or or maybe look into uh, that you know to further further our knowledge that of what what could have happened. So okay. I don't know what about like what's has your estimate changed at all, Stuart? <laughs> so I still think a natural overspill rocking up in Wuhan is probably the most likely explanation. Putting a number on that uh, is fairly meaningless. So, but anyway, let's let's say it's still of the same order as I started this off with. I mean, I cannot rule out, and no one can rule out um, there being a live progenitor in the Wuhan Institute of Virology without um, you know some some empirical evidence that 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 we can point to I don't think there's any any of the circumstantial evidence that's out there at the moment is um, is uh, uh, is conclusive of a lab leak in any shape or form I think there are certain things that would, you know, make you ask the question. And if I went there, I'd be asking exactly these questions that Yuri wants answered. Um, but I don't. Which are, which are what, Stuart? Just to summarise, why I the database? Know, would I, I would like to know what was there or what they were working on. Whether, in fact, as has been um, uh, accused, that they may have started some of the work of the DARPA grant themselves rather than their collaborators. Um, and what was in their freezers? I mean, the trouble is, is that you do need their cooperation for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got... <laughs> which, so it becomes this sort of like um, un, unfulfillable sort of, of investigation in that respect. I mean, I, I think you're right. I don't think we're going to get any genetic evidence that um, uh, that directly implicates the lab ever. Because if they if, if there was, it would have been got rid of. The only way that's going to come out is some sort of human human intel. I think probably the most 
important questions to be answered, at least to, to sort of firm up the circumstantial evidence on one side or the other, is more access to the early cases mm. in Wuhan, trying to get an idea of how far back they go. I don't think maybe your listeners may know, but there is quite a lot of evidence of a, a big spike in respiratory infections across Hubei province in October 2019, not just Wuhan, that haven't been particularly explicable. Um, there's a good, you know, if that's true, then there's a reasonable chance that it may did maybe didn't start in Wuhan itself, but only became visible, you know, came onto the radar when it ended up in Wuhan. And just just to be be clear, I mean, in the in the in the west of Wuhan, there's a lot of bat colonies that do harbour sub ecoviruses. So um, and they Hubei, have, mean, yeah, west of sorry, in, in Hubei. So, I mean, it's still a bit of a distance, but it's the same province. So um, I think there are a lot of questions from the early outbreak that we need to know is how far back can we trace odd respiratory infections that no one's got an explanation for? Because there's a good chance that people missed a lot of this as well. And, you know, there might be a lot of cover up, but there might be just a lot of bad record keeping or not even not not associating this as being anything out of the ordinary in coming into respiratory virus season anyway. So we have to do have to keep in mind that that not everything is going to be a cover up. Some of it just might be that it wasn't noticed or it wasn't picked up because it was amongst the noise of everything else that goes on at that time of year. Like the Furin Cleavage side, the, the Wuhan is the virology didn't notice when they were putting out RATG-13 in, in that paper, right? They, I we guess asked they... them. I asked them. <laughs> I wrote an email to them. I asked them about that. So this is my one, this and the, the colleagues, one, um, one sort of bit of investigative work that we've done on this is to actually write to the Wuha, the first author of that paper and say, why didn't you include the FCS in that? Yeah. And they said, we were focused on the S1 and the ACE2 binding site. We didn't notice it. I have an email to that effect. That's what they told me. Now, you can believe that. I, can, I can't possibly comment or influence you. Cut it off right at the Furing Cleavage site. Like off the S1, S2 boundary. Yeah. Like, um, um, it just <laughs> blows my mind. The, and and yeah. there were, we're, like, there we're, were opening up, we're opening up new... We're opening up new... <laughs> Uh, you just want to kick us out. Yeah, this could go on all afternoon. <laughs> I could jump off the call and I'll I'll come back at in like three hours' time and you'll still be here. <laughs> right. um, thank That's you, thank thank topic. you guys for, for that. That was a really um, deep and comprehensive um, dive into the science. So thank you very much for for being part of it. <laughs>